Uh, hello everybody, uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, our second day for the second week is starting uh, with Alberto's uh, second talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So today we will go on talking about uh, GTO structures on seven manifolds in this uh, second lecture on the introductory part on G2 geometry. So yesterday we saw some motivation about why considering uh, G2 structures and G2 geometry coming from Riemannian holonomy theory. Then we saw some algebraic properties of the group G2, including its definition, some properties, and some representation theory related to it that we will use today. And in the last part of the lecture, we moved from algebraic point of view to the manifold level, and I defined what uh, a G2 structure on a seven manifold is. And let me recall that uh, if you consider a seven dimensional smooth manifold, then you can define this uh, open subbundle lambda three plus of the cotangent uh, of the bundle of three forms on the manifold, whose fiber over each point X of the manifold is given by the three forms on the tangent space to the manifold at the point that can be identified with the standard three form phi naught we introduced yesterday on the vector space R7 to define uh, the group G2. And uh, as we said yesterday in the last part of the lecture, this is just a pointwise identification. And uh, I will say something more in some remarks in a while. Uh, so in particular, uh, this is, uh, if you want, a non-canonical definition of a G2 structure, as in general, when you have a smooth manifold with the frame bundle, you talk about a G structure uh, as a G reduction of the frame bundle to some principal G subbundle where G is some closed subgroup of the general linear group. Uh, but actually, these two definitions turn out to be equivalent and in particular, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between G2 structures defined in this way and G2 reductions of the frame bundle of the manifold. So now, as you uh, remember from yesterday, we saw that uh, on, uh, let me use similar notations so on the vector space D, which is a seven, we have the, uh, standard three form phi naught, whose expression uh, was given in yesterday's lecture, that induces, let's say, so this is the standard three form that we use to define G2, and phi naught induces an inner product and a volume four on R7. And it turns out that this implies that at the manifold level, so let's say consequently, a G2 structure phi on the manifold induces both a Riemannian metric. that I shall denote by G phi to remember that it is induced by the three form phi and an orientation on the manifold. And in particular, uh, the Riemannian metric G phi and the associated Riemannian volume form that I shall denote by either by ball phi or by ball g phi, but just remember that it is not just any volume form, but precisely the Riemannian volume form induced by the metric g phi uh, can be obtained. So these two objects can be obtained from the three form phi 
as follows. You have that G phi of two vector fields x, y times the, its Riemannian volume four equals one over six, the two form given by the contraction of phi with x wedge, the two form given by the contraction of phi with uh, y wedge phi for all x and y vector fields on the manifold. And so in particular, as a consequence, you have a Riemannian metric, you have a volume form, and then you can define the Hodge operators that again, I shall denote by star phi to remember that they depend on the three form phi. And so they are defined from the spaces of K forms to the spaces of seven minus K forms on the manifold. Um, okay, so uh, as you can see from this uh, description, so this is, should be not a big surprise if you remember the expression of the linear form B phi not we introduced yesterday. Uh, but as you can see from the discussion, if you have a G2 structure, it induces an orientation on the manifold. So in particular, this implies that it cannot, a G2 structure cannot exist if the manifold is not orientable. But this is not enough. There, are, there is a further condition that has to be satisfied. Uh, so let's remark this. So phi determines an orientation So this implies that it does not exist if the manifold is not orientable. But this is not enough for the existence. In fact, we have this theorem saying that a smooth seven manifold admits G2 structures so in other words that opens a bundle lambda three plus of the bundle of three forms is non-empty if and only if the manifold is both orientable and spinnable. So it admits spin structures. And these two conditions are equivalent to the vanishing of the first and second Stiefel Whitney classes of the manifold. So first and second. Stiefel, Whitney, classes of the manifold have to vanish. And in the literature, this was first observed by Alfred Gray in a paper going back in 1969 where you can find the proof if you're interested in it. Otherwise, there is a, you can find proofs of this fact also in the book by Lawson Mikkelson on spin geometry and uh, also in the notes by Bryant uh, that you can find in the references to the, of the, to, to, for the course in the website. And uh, let me remark that these two conditions that you already met last week in one of the lectures are topological conditions. So it means that the existence of G2 structures on a seven dimensional manifold is a, is a topological issue. So it depends on the topological properties of the manifold. So this is a topological condition. So let me give now some remarks. 
about the G2 structures we defined. So first of all, as we already said yesterday at the end of the lecture, at each point of the manifold, there exists a basis, like let's call it E1, E2, E7 with upper indices of the cotangent space to the manifold at that point, such that a G2 structure phi at that point can be written in the canonical way. So in the standard form. Let me see if it works. No. Okay, good, it crashed. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry for this. Let me see whether I'm able to fix this. Okay, so let's say this is equal to the canonical tree form, standard tree form. On our side. And you can, uh, get, you can obtain the seed ex expression from yesterday's such. And, but pay attention to the fact that this does not mean that there exists in the neighborhood of X a uh, set of local coordinates that allow you to write the form in this way. So this is just a pointwise expression of the three form. So in general, it is not possible. To do this with respect. To a local coordinate. Frame. You can do this only when the G structure is actually integrable, which is a much stronger condition that has to be satisfied by the G2 structure. Then another remark is that the bundle lambda three plus we introduced of the bundle of three forms on the manifold is an open subbundle, as we said. This means that small perturbation of a G2 structure are again G2 structures. So if you add some uh, three form of small norm in a suitable sense, that you will again get a G2 structure. And this is important, especially when you talk about geometric flows of G2 structures, since this guarantees that when you have a geometric flow that is well posed, so for which there exists, for, so for which you have short time existence and uniqueness of the solutions, this property guarantees that the solution, since it exists for short times, is a small perturbation of the initial G2 structure you have. And so it is still a G2 structure. It still defines a G2 structure. Moreover, we say that if you have a G2 structure phi, then it induces a Riemannian matrix G phi on the manifold. But actually, there is a huge set of G2 structures inducing the same metric. And in fact, 
set of G2 structures on the manifold inducing the same metric that induces this three form, this G2 structure field we have fixed is parameterized by the projective space RP7, which is isomorphic to SO7 over G2. And more precisely, if you're interested in seeing the expression, you can find it in Brian's notes. And it is the following. If you pick a real number, a, 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 a function, a smooth function on the manifold, if you pick a one form alpha on the manifold, such that a squared plus the square norm of alpha equals one, then all three forms, let's call them phi a alpha, defined in this way, induce the same metric and orientation as the three form we have. So a squared minus square norm of alpha phi plus two alpha star phi of alpha wedge phi plus twice alpha wedge star phi of alpha wedge star phi. So this is a G2 structure inducing the same metric and orientation. as the G2 structure field we fixed. And so, and in particular, if you notice, if you switch the sign of both A and alpha, you get the same uh, three form. And so from this and this uh, identity here, it is clear that you are parameterizing this with an RP7. And finally, let me just add some remark about how to compute explicitly the metric and volume form starting from a G2 structure. Because pay attention to the fact that uh, what we said here is that at each point there exists, if V is a G2 structure, at each point there exists a basis that allows you to write it in the standard form. But in general, the expression of the three form V defining a G2 structure might be really wild. And so it might be also difficult to explicitly obtain these bases, but of course not impossible. So when you have a three form, there is an operative way, if you want, to um, understand whether it uh, defines a G2 structure working in coordinates. And this is especially useful on uh, when you work on, for instance, on homogeneous spaces or on spaces that are of homogeneity one, where you can compute explicitly the threefold. So it is useful, especially in these cases. So the last remark is about how to compute the metric and the associated volume four from the threefold fee. So in this case, let us consider some uh, local coordinate frame. So let, let's say X1 to X7 be local coordinates on an open set. U of the manifold M and I will denote by the I, the local vector fields induced by these coordinates and by the X, I, the covector fields defined in U. And we define the symmetric to form B that we met yesterday in components, B, I, J, uh, the 
x1 wedge dx2 wedge dx7. So if you remember, uh, this was defining the proof of the where we showed the properties of the group G2. Uh, this was one over six di contracted with phi wedge dj contracted with phi wedge phi. So when you have the three form phi, you can compute, you can make this computation and obtain these uh, components of the uh, delinear form B. But uh, we know that this has to be equal to G phi evaluated in the IDJ times its Riemannian volume four for what we said before. So times the square root of the determinant of G phi, the X1 wedge, the X7. So from this, you see that when you have a three form, any three form, and you would like to understand whether it defines a G2 structure, you can compute this symmetric to tensor, the components of this symmetric to tensor here by means of this identity. And you know that you would like them to be equal to something like this. So this implies in particular that Bij has to be equal to Gij, where now this Gij are just these components here, times the square root of the determinant of G phi. So from this, taking the determinants of the matrices associated with these two uh, guys here, you get that the determinant of B is equal to the determinant of G to the power of nine over two. And so this gives you that the square root of the determinant of G or yeah, also G phi, it is again, it, it is equal to the determinant of B to one over nine. So again, looking at this, at this expression here and to this expression here, you get that G phi is given by one over the determinant of B to the power of one over nine times B, where B is the bilinear form with whose uh, coordinate expression is the following is Bij. And the volume form induced by phi is given by the determinant of B to the power of one over nine, the X1 wedge, the X7. So this is what's going on. So this tells you how you can compute the metric and the volume form induced by the tree form when it defines a G2 structure. And it tells you in particular that a tree form phi, any tree form phi, on the manifold defines a G2 structure if and only if in any local chart first determinant of the bilinear form B so it's different from zero and second one over the determinant of B to the power of one over nine times B is positive definite as it has to define a Riemannian metric. And in particular, this happens if and only if B is definite. So it can be either positive or negative definite. Everything is fine since then you divide by the determinant and you get something that is positive definite. And as I say, this is particularly useful when you work on homogeneous spaces or on homogeneity one spaces, since you do your computations in some special points of the manifold. So with respect to some special uh, frame, 
And in that case, you might have a three form whose expression is quite bad, but you can work out the expression, the coordinate expression of this symmetric to tensor B and determine its determinant and determine this uh, linear form here. And if these two conditions are satisfied, then this ensures you that the tree form you have actually defines a G structure on the manifold. Okay, so these were some remarks. And so now we can go back to what we saw yesterday. So we say that the interest in G2 structures is motivated by the fact that G2 is one of the possible anomaly groups for a Riemannian metric uh, with suitable, uh, under suitable assumptions arising in project classification of Riemannian anomaly groups. And so now the, pro the problem is given a G2 structure phi on a seven manifold, when is the lonomy group of the induced metric as a group of G2. Well, uh, we can use uh, the lonely principle, first of all, that we mentioned yesterday and you also met last week, to observe that if P, the three from P is parallel with respect to the Levi Civita connection of the induced matrix. So let me denote by nabla G phi, the Levi Civita connection induced by the matrix G phi. And if the three form phi is parallel with respect to the Levi Civita connection, then the Lonomy principle tells you that the Lonomy group of the Riemannian matrix G phi has to be a subgroup of G2. And conversely, if you have some Riemannian metric G on a seven manifold, such that its Riemannian anomaly group is a subgroup of G2, then there exists a G2 structure phi on the manifold that induces that Riemannian matrix, so for which the induced Riemannian matrix is precisely G, and it is parallel with respect to the Levi Civita connection. So this characterizes the reduction of the lonomy group of the metric induced by a JIT structure uh, in terms of the covariant derivative of the JIT structure. And observe that the equation requiring phi to be parallel with respect to the levi civita connection of the metric it induces is nonlinear in the three-form phi, precisely because you are computing this with respect to the levi civita connection of the metric G phi, which is in turn defined by the three-form phi. So the G2 structures satisfying this condition here are called parallel or torsion free. So a G2 structure phi is said to be parallel or torsion free if it satisfies these conditions. If it is parallel with respect to the Levi Civita connection of the metric it induces. And the second uh, way in which we call them is motivated by the fact that actually you can identify the covariant derivative of phi with respect to the Levi Civita connection induced by the metric G phi with the intrinsic torsion of the G2 structure seen as a principal subbundle of the frame bundle of the manifold. Now, this is the condition, and actually, there is a nicer way to rewrite this condition here, which was proved by Fernandez and Gray. In 1982, that tells you that if you have 
a GT structure phi, then it is torsion free or parallel if and only if the three form is both closed and co closed, which are two conditions uh, uh, that are let's say in some sense better to use compared with the condition requiring the three form to be parallel. And let me give an idea of the proof. So in one direction, it is actually immediate since uh, both the phi, so the differential of phi and the differential of the four form star phi can be written using the covariant derivative of phi with respect to the levi civita connection. And so if it is zero, then you immediately get that both, the, both, of them, both of them are zero. In the other direction, it is possible to show this using uh, what we introduced yesterday. So I'm not going to give the precise proof that Fernandez and Greg gave since it was based essentially on working on, with the vector cross product induced by a G2 structure, but I'm going to give an equivalent proof that can be found, for instance, in uh, uh, papers by Carigiannis and also in a paper by Bryant. Uh, so we can consider the, the compositions of the spaces of forms, of four forms on M and five forms on M that are induced by the pointwise decompositions of the spaces of four forms and five forms into G2 irreducible summons that we saw in yesterday's lecture. So in particular, the, spaces, the space of uh, four forms splits as a sum of a one-dimensional space plus a seven dimensional pointwise seven dimensional space plus pointwise 27 dimensional space where the exterior differential of phi belongs. And these spaces here, as you remember, are obtained from the decomposition of the space of three forms just applying the Hodge operator. And similarly, the space of five forms that composes as the direct sum of a space that is pointwise seven dimensional plus a space that is pointwise 14 dimensional. And you know that the differential of star phi will belong to this space here. So as a consequence, there exists some unique forms, let's say tau z tau naught, a smooth function tau one and tau one tilde one forms on the manifold. Then we have tau two in omega two fourteen and tau three in omega three twenty seven, for which you can write, you can decompose the zero differential of phi with respect to this decomposition here. So we will have something here, which is just a function times the Hodge dual of the four form of the three form phi. So this will be tau zero star phi of phi plus three times tau one wedge phi. And this is just uh, for simply to simplify something that I will say later, these three that you can that you see here, plus star phi of tau three, and remember that as we said yesterday, the space uh, lambda four twenty seven is obtained by applying the Hodge dual to lambda three twenty seven. So there is no big surprise here, and then the differential of star phi is given by four tau one tilde wedge. 
star field phi plus tau to watch phi, where again we are using the expressions uh, of uh, forms belonging to the spaces that follow from the description from the point by description we gave yesterday. So just have a look to what we wrote yesterday and compare to convince yourself that you can write something like this here. Now some facts are as follow. So first of all, you can show that actually tau one tilde has to coincide with tau one. So actually these two one forms are equal. Moreover, you can show that for every vector field X on the manifold, if you consider the covariant der derivative of phi in the direction of X, then it belongs to the space omega 3, 7, which from what we said yesterday is the space that you can write at the manifold level as the contractions of vector fields with the four form star phi. So in particular, since uh, this object, this three form belongs to this space, there exists some endomorphism of the tangent bundle, allowing you to write Nabla G phi X of phi as T applied to X contraction with star phi. So come back uh, because of this identification here. And now again, if you remember from yesterday, we saw that we saw what pointwise the composition of this bundle actually. So we saw what's going on for the endomorphism bundle of our for sorry, for the space of endomorphism of our seven under the action of G2. And at the manifold level, let's say you can decompose this as the space of there's the direct sum of the space of two forms and the space of symmetric two tensors. And from what we said yesterday, it follows that it is equivalent to omega 2 7 plus omega 2 14 plus uh, the space of trace free symmetric tensors plus something like smooth functions times the Riemannian metric G phi. So you can decompose uniquely your endomorphins T under these identifications in the sum of four components belonging to, the, to these four spaces here. And you can show that this T with respect to this decomposition here can be written in terms of these four forms here. So with respect to two, tau zero, tau one, tau two, and tau three. And in detail, you can find the, the precise computations, for instance, in the book uh, lectures and surveys on G2 manifolds and related topics, and in particular in the survey by Karigiannis on uh, G2 geometry. Uh, if you're interested in looking at the precise computations, you can see that you have something like tau zero over four G phi, which is the component of T inside this sum here, minus the vector field tau one sharp associated with tau one contracted with phi, which gives you the, the, the component here in lambda to seven, uh, minus one half tau two, which gives you the component in omega two fourteen, and finally minus i phi of tau three, where i was the map going from uh, Let's say from symmetric tensors to three forms. So, sure. Okay. And this gives you the component you have here. Yeah, actually, this was J phi. Okay. So, in particular, you have that T is equal to zero, which means that phi is parallel if and only if all tau i's are equal to zero for all i equals zero, one, 
two and three, and so if and only if V is both closed and co-closed. So this is the idea, of course, the details have to be filled, but this is what's going on. So this is how one can prove that uh, the second equivalent, so the if direction you have here. Okay. Uh, is the theorem true for open manifolds? In which sense, sorry? Those two conditions. So this is true, this is true in general. In general, okay. Compact yeah, or yeah. Without compact. Yeah, this just yeah, this just depend on the this representation theory argument. I see. Thank you. Okay, so as you can as we as you can see from here, we have these nice expressions for the differential of phi and star phi in terms of these uh, differential forms tau zero, tau one, tau two, and tau three. And in particular, we can give this definition. So the unique forms tau zero, tau one, tau two and tau three, for which you can write the zero differential of phi as tau zero star phi plus three tau one wedge phi plus star phi of tau three, and the zero differential of star phi as four tau one wedge star phi plus tau two wedge phi are called the intrinsic torsion forms of the G2 structure. And again, this is because they determine the intrinsic torsion of the G2 structure uh, for the reasons we said some minutes ago. So now, before saying something about the construction of manifolds admitting a torsion free G2 structure, which is a highly non-trivial problem, let me just recall the last result about torsion free G2 structures, which is this theorem by Bonan that I already mentioned yesterday in the last part during the question time. That tells you that if a G2 structure phi is torsion free, then the associated Riemannian metric is Ricci flat. So which is the idea of the proof here? So in particular, the idea in Bonan's proof was using the fact that the having a torsion free G2 structure implies that the alonum is a subgroup of G2, and so this gives some constraints on the Riemann curvature tensor. So in particular, since in this case, the alonomy of the Riemannian metric is a subgroup of G2, it follows that its alonomy algebra is contained in the Lie algebra of the Lie group G2. And moreover, it follows from the theory of Riemannian alonomy and the, and the symmetries of the Riemann curvature tensor uh, that let's say that if R denotes, so let's say that R be the four zero curvature tensor of G phi, then what you can show is that at each point of the manifold R belongs to the symmetric product of the Lie algebra of the Lonomy group of the Riemannian metric at the point 
which in our case is the symmetric product of the Lie algebra of G2. And as I said yesterday, so this means that this matrix, so this object here has four indices. And besides, in addition to the symmetries, you already have for the Riemannian curvature tensor uh, coming from the definition and its properties, you have some extra symmetries coming from the fact that you have it pointwise belongs to this space here. So if you write down the expression of the components of the Ricci tensor, uh, and then you apply in a suitable way the first Bianca identity, and you use the identities you get from the fact that this tensor here pointwise has to belong to this space, with after some computations, what you get is that all the components of the Ricci tensor are zero. And so in this way, you can prove directly that it, the metric is Ricci flat. There is actually another proof that is more related to representation theory, uh, which is given by, which was given by Alexievsky. Uh, let's say rather than farther or different. Proof was given by Alexievsky. And the idea is the following. At each point, when you see your Riemann tensor, the, cur the curvature tensor as a, as a, as a four zero tensor so, and belonging to this space of uh, sim two symmetric power of the, the algebra G2, then pointwise, R belongs to the symmetric product of G2 with itself intersected with the kernel of the wedge map going from S2 of G2 to lambda 4. And this follows from the fact that if you remember in coordinates, the Riemann tensor, let's say if you have R, R, A, B, C, D, then it is equal to R, C, D, A, B. So you have this type of symmetry. And so uh, this tensor pointwise has to belong to the kernel of the wedge product of the two components you have here. So what you have is that the second symmetric power of G2 can be decomposed into G2 reducible representation as follows. You will have a one dimensional uh, irreducible space plus the space of trace free symmetric two tensors plus a 77 G2 reducible subspace. And on the other end, we saw yesterday that lambda 4, and we called it uh, previously, that lambda 4 decomposes as lambda 4 1 plus lambda 4. 7 plus lambda 4, 27. This wedge here is G2 equivariant, and in particular, it is injective in the R component and in the S20 component. So this means that the R component will go to the one dimensional uh, submodule of lambda 4, S20 that has dimension 27 and is G2 irreducible will be mapped isomorphically to lambda 427. So this means that since R has to belong to the kernel of this operator here, it has to belong to this module W77. So from this, you get that at each point, the curvature tensor belongs to W27. So this means in particular that it has no components neither in R nor in S20. But for the Riemann tensor, this component is what controls the Trace free part of the Ricci tensor, and this component is what controls the scalar curvature. So, this summon here is what controls the Ricci, ten the Ricci tensor induced by the Riemann curvature tensor. So, in particular, since this Riemann curvature tensor has no components here, you get that 
the rigid tensor of the metric induced by phi is equal to zero. So of course, this is the idea roughly of what's going on. One has to fill all the details, but this is an alternative way to show this fact here. Okay. So now we can move on and uh, discuss something about torsion-free G2 structures. Just recall what we know about manifolds with a torsion bridge to structure and about, in particular, manifolds, semi manifolds admitting matrix with holonomy equal to G2. So let's start giving a definition. So we say that a G2 manifold is a seven manifold. M endowed with a torsion free G2 structure. So, which means that the three form phi is parallel with respect to the Levy Chifta connection of the induced metric and it is both closed and co closed. So, and moreover, of course, that. the holonomy group of the Riemannian metric is a subgroup of G2. And so in particular, a G2 manifold is said to be irreducible, irreducible if the holonomy of G phi is precisely G2. And let me remark here that the fact that the Riemannian holonomy is contained in G2 uh, implies that the Ricci tensor is zero, so the metric is Ricci flat, and this gives some strong restrictions on various properties of the manifold, and in particular on its symmetries. So in particular, since the Ricci tensor is zero, in such a case, if we have an irreducible uh, compact G2 manifold, then its symmetry group is finite. It does not have continuous symmetries and so symmetry techniques cannot be used to obtain examples. And so, so for instance, you can't use, uh, uh, you can't find the uh, irreducible uh, G2 manifolds that are homogeneous or of homogeneity one and compact. Uh, so this makes it really hard to find examples uh, in general. And uh, of course, since we define what is an irreducible G2 manifold, there are also reducible G2 manifolds. And in fact, there are some examples of reducible G2 manifolds. So whose holonomy is, is a proper subgroup of G2 that can be obtained starting from known manifolds with special holonomy. And they can be obtained as follows. So first of all, let's start with a remark given by Joyce in his paper where he constructed the first compact examples of reducible G2 manifolds. So the remark is the following. If you have a look at the Berger theorem, classification theorem, you can, conclude that the only connected subgroups of G2, which are the lonomy group, the, which can be the lonomy groups of a Riemannian metric on a seven manifold are the following. We have the trivial subgroup. We have SU2 
we have uh, CO3 and, of course, G2. And so this tells you in particular that if phi is a torsion free G2 structure, then the restricted holonomy group of the induced Riemannian metric must be one of these groups. And if you remember, we say that every Ronomy group comes with a representation on the tangent space on the tangent space of the point. And in this case, the action you have of SU2 on R7 is given identifying R7 with R3 direct sum with C2 and having SU2 that acts trivially on R3 and acts in the usual way on C2 while the action of SU3 on R7 is given by identifying R7 with R direct sum with C3 and considering SU3 that acts trivially on the R component and acts in the usual way on the C3 component. So these are the possible Holonomies for the reducible manifold. So we have for our reducible G2 manifold. So we have the trivial holonomy group, SU2 and SU3. And the examples we can find are the following starting from known lower dimensional manifolds with special holonomy. So let's say we have the seven manifold, we have the three form phi, and we have the holonomy of the metric. So to obtain the a manifold with a trivial holonomy group, you can just consider the seven torus endowed with the standard three form phi naught we introduced yesterday. So just considering suitable coordinates on the seven torus to define it, and you will get that induced metric as trivial holonomy group. In the case of uh, holonomy SU2, you can consider the product of a three torus with a Calabial twofold. And in such a case, you will have a Calabial SU3 torsion free SU3 structure. So you will have in particular a complex structure J, a Riemannian metric H, and a holomorphic uh, two zero form omega. And you will have a fundamental to form, uh, let's say, small omega defined as Hj in this way. And if you consider a global parallel frame on T3, let's call it E1, E2, and E3 with upper indices, then the G2 uh, three form you can define here uh, that is torsion free is the following it is E1, 2, 3 plus E1 wedge omega plus E2 wedge, the real part of capital omega minus E3 wedge, the imaginary part of capital omega. And in such a case, the holonomy is SU2. So it is the holonomy of the metric, of the Calabial metric you have on your Calabial two-fold. And finally, to get holonomy SU3, you can consider the product of the circle with a Calabial threefold. So you will have a similar data now on a six on a real six dimensional manifold. And you can define a three form using a global one form here on S1 that I showed denote by E1. And the three form defining the G2 structure is the following. You have E1, which omega plus the real part of the holomorphic three zero form capital omega. And in such a case, you get a manifold that has a torsion free G2 structure defined by this, this three form here that is reducible since its holonomy is SU3. So, so these are examples that you can obtain starting from known examples of manifolds with special holonomy and are all giving reducible G2 manifolds. Uh, so what, what can we say for the case when the holonomy group is precisely G2. 
Well, there are some conditions ensuring that we have the equality in the inclusions. of whole G inside G2. In particular, we know the following facts. So the first, this first fact was proved by Joyce. And it tells us that on a compact manifold, the Lonomy group of the Riemannian metric is precisely equal to G2 if and only if the fundamental group of the manifold is finite. So this is a topological restriction you have on the manifold in order to obtain uh, your autonomy G2 matrix. And this uh, equivalence here follows from using the Chigagromo splitting for the Ricci flat manifold and down with a torsion to structure. In particular, you know that uh, if you have a manifold with a torsion to structure, the metric is rich flat, then you can, if the manifold is compact, it is finitely covered by the product of a torus time, a rich flat compact manifold. And you can uh, consider the possible holonomy groups and conclude that uh, in the case where the holonomy group is precisely G2, then this forces the fundamental group of the manifold to be finite. And moreover, if the manifold is not compact, but it is uh, complete and simply connected, we have another criterion that was proved by Ryan Solomon in 1989, that tells you that on M compact, not sorry, not compact, on M complete, and simply connected, what we have is that the lonomy group of the metric G is equal to G2 if and only if there does not exist any non zero parallel one form. on the manifold. Okay, so these are some criteria that one can use in the suitable settings of compact or complete simply connected manifolds when a torsion to structure can be obtained to ensure that the lonomy group of the induced uh, Riemannian metric is precisely G2. There are some further necessary conditions for the existence of torsion to structures on compact semi-manifolds. Let me briefly recall them. Let's say, let's focus directly on irreducible. Torsion free. G2 structures on compact seven manifolds. So here, of course, irreducible means that the torsion free G2 structure induces a metric with holonomy whose holonomy is precisely G2. Then, first of all, we say that the first fundamental group of the manifold has to be finite. And so this implies in particular that the first betting number of the manifold has to be zero. So on a further topological condition, then the third betting number of the manifold has to be greater than or equal to one. And this is because the cohomology class of phi, or let's say since phi is a non-zero, parallel one four on the manifold since it is both closed and co-closed. And as you can see this condition here holds more generally 
for torsion bridge to structures on a compact manifold. So it is not necessary that the manifold is irreducible, but in particular, it must hold when the manifold is irreducible. Then we have a quadratic form defined from the second cohomology group of the manifold. So define the need. That is defined as Q of some class beta equals to the integral over M of beta wedge beta wedge phi. And this quadratic form, which is well defined, and actually the fact that it is well defined only depends on the cohomology class of phi. So it is just necessary, it is sufficient to focusing on G2 structures defined by a three form that is closed to obtain a good definition of this uh, object here. And what you have is that this quadratic form has to be negative definite. And to show this, you use both the fact that the first betty number of the manifold is trivial and the fact that the space in such a case, so when this happens, the space, uh, the second cohomology group of the manifold is isomorphic to the space of harmonic forms belonging to the subspace omega 214 inside the space of two forms. So you can take a representative of this beta, which actually belongs to omega 214, and use the fact that in such a case, if you take this wedge product here, it's just a computation using the definitions, you will get minus the square norm of beta times the volume four induced uh, by the metric GP. So this is roughly the idea. And again, these are just some remarks. Uh, of course, the details have to be filled in a proper way. And finally, the real first contriaging class of the manifold. has to be different from zero. And this follows from the fact that this class, which is belongs to H4 and R is a cohomology class represented by one over eight by squared trace of the wedge product of the curve to tensor wedge itself. And again, using the fact that we have polonomy inside G2, you have the, restri the restriction here on the curve to tensor saying that actually pointwise in its skew symmetric components, it has to belong to the submodule lambda 214. And then you can use that identity to show that if you integrate uh, the wedge product of this against phi over the manifold, uh, you will get something that is not zero if the G2 structure is not is torsion free, but not flat. So we follow only that is equal to G2 and is not flat. So this is, these are roughly the ideas. So there are some necessary conditions that are known in the case of compact manifolds. And so for sure, you won't have any hope to obtain an irreducible uh, compact uh, uh, G2 manifold, if your manifold, your, if your compact manifold does not satisfy these uh, topological conditions here. Uh, so what about examples now? So what, which type of examples do we know of torsion free G2 structures whose holonomy is precisely G2? Well, the first examples were obtained by Bryant back in 1987. And these were incomplete examples on small balls in R7 that were obtained using the 
theory of exterior differential systems and Kapp-Tankela theory. So you obtain the first local incomplete examples on small balls, no seven, using the theory of exterior differential systems and Kaptan Kerotik. Then Brian Solomon obtained the first complete examples, but still non compact in 1889. using symmetry techniques. And in particular, their examples are of homogeneity one with respect to the action of a shadow group. And they were obtained on some total spaces of vector bundles. In particular, they obtain examples on the space of anti-self dual two forms over the full sphere on the space of anti-self-dual two forms over the complex projective space of dimension two and on the spin of bundle of the three sphere, which is diffeomorphic to R4 across the three sphere. In the first case, you have the group SP2 that acts with homogeneity one, so with principal orbits of co-dimension one in the manifold. And in this case, the principal orbits here are CP3s. In the second case, you have the group SU2, SU3, sorry, acting with homogeneity one, and the principal orbits are the flag manifolds SU3 over T2. And in this last case, you have the group SU3, sorry, SU2, cube acting with homogeneity one. And in this case, the principal orbits are the product of two, three spheres. And as you may guess, to show that the examples they obtained are torsion free, they prove that since the, this manifold here and these examples here are uh, simply connected and complete, they proved that there are no uh, non-parallel uh, one forms on the manifold to show that the only group is precisely G2. So using that criterion that we mentioned before. So what about compact examples instead? Well, now we know many compact examples of irreducible G2 manifolds. The first ones were obtained by Joyce in his 1996 paper where you can find some of the results I mentioned and quoted by him previously. Uh, then after that, Kovalev, with different techniques, obtained examples of irreducible G2 manifolds. Then there is a paper by Corti, Haskins, Nordstrom, and Pacini going back in 2015. And finally, recently, Joyce Carigiannis obtained new examples using different techniques, but all these techniques that are used here are doing constructions. In particular, in the case of Joyce, in his first examples, he started with an orbifold, uh, considering a suitable seven manifold with a torsion pre structure. So for instance, the seven torus with the standard G2 structure, considering the group, a finite group acting on it, preserving the G2 structure and obtaining in this way, the quotient of the torus by the finite group, which is an orbifold, and then resolving the singularities of that orbifold. Uh, then, these papers here by Kovalev and Corti Askins, Norsen, Pacini 
involve a different type of viewing construction, which is the so-called twisted connected sound technique that allows one to obtain manifolds that at the end of the day will be irreducible due to manifolds gluing shootable uh, asymptotically cylindrical uh, non-compact manifolds with smaller holonomy. And uh, while the last type of construction given by Joyce Carigianis is based on uh, some different type of construction that involves the gluing of some Ergutians and spaces. Uh, so these are all gluing constructions and uh, they are, let's say the goal of these constructions is to obtain a compact manifold which is endowed with a closed G2 structure so we have a digital structure whose three form defining it is just closed and such that the co-differential of that three form is small in a shootable sense. And then by a theorem of Joyce, it is possible to perturb that three form in order to obtain a torsion free one. So you can use, let's say a key result that is used to and guarantees the existence of torsion pre to structures on compact manifolds. Is a theorem by Joyce that is so far the only known existence result we, we have for torsion pre to structures on compact manifolds. And I'm, before mentioning it, let me just again explain the idea. So the idea in all these works is to construct a compact manifold admitting a torsion free, uh, sorry, a closed G2 structure whose torsion is small in a sense that I'm going to explain now, and then use this theorem by Joyce to ensure that on these manifolds, you can obtain a torsion free G2 structure by perturbing the closed G2 structure with small torsion you have at the beginning. Once you have done this, you just have a torsion free G2 structure, and then you have to check that the uh, first fundamental group of the manifold is finite in order to guarantee that the G2, the G2 manifold is actually irreducible. So there is, these manifolds has also to be carefully constructed uh, by paying attention to the topology. As once you have a torsion pre structure, the topology of the manifold tells you whether the, the G2 manifold will be irreducible or not. So to conclude, let me mention this theorem by Joyce. Again, in the same paper that I mentioned before, so in this 1996 paper. So this tells you the conditions ensuring when a closed G2 structure with shootable small torsion can be deformed into a torsion free G2 structure. So the theorem goes as follows. So Thus, you consider, consider some positive constants, let's say alpha, k1, k2, and k3. Then there exists some epsilon in zero one and some positive number k4 such that whenever you pick some t beside, uh, among zero and epsilon the following holds so consider a compact seven manifold with a closed G2 structure. V, 
which means that phi is just closed but not co closed. Assume that there exists a closed for form eta. For which the following conditions hold. So first of all, you want that the difference between the Hodge duo of phi, so the four forms are phi and eta in the C0 norm is controlled by K1 times T to the alpha. Then you require that the difference between these two guys again in the L2 norm is controlled by K1 times T to the seven over two plus alpha. Then you require that the differential of this full form in the L14 norm is controlled by K1 times t to minus one half plus alpha. Then you require that the injectivity radius of g phi is such that it is greater than or equal to k2 times t. And finally, you require a bound on the Riemann to tensor, and in fact, a C0 bound, you require that it's C0 norm is less than or equal to K3 times T to the minus two. So when this happens, so when all of these conditions are satisfied, there exists a torsion frigid to structure Let's call it phi twiddle, such that it is C0 closed to the closed to structure we have at the beginning. So this is less than or equal to K for T to the power of alpha. And that belongs to the same cohomology class. So the cohomology class of phi twiddle is the same as phi. And all the norms here are all computed using the metric induced by phi. So what this theorem is telling you is that if you have a compact seven manifold with a closed to structure, which is, let's say in some sense, almost closed since all of these conditions here tell you that the four form given by star phi is close to a closed four form, then you can perturb your closed to structure in order to obtain a torsion-free one that is uh, in the same homology class as the G2 structure, as, as the closed G2 structure phi. And so again, in all the known constructions of irre compact irreducible G2 manifolds, the idea is to obtain, to produce a compact manifold endowed with a closed G2 structure for which all of these conditions are satisfied, and then use this theorem by Joyce to conclude that there exists a torsion frigidity structure on the compact manifold we have constructed. Once you have done that, if the manifold has finite fundamental group, then you can conclude that the manifold is actually an irreducible G2 manifold. So the allonomy is precisely equal to G2. And uh, yeah, we are almost done with the time. So let me just remark, as I said before, that so far, this is the only known result we have ensuring the existence of torsion frigid structures on compact semi manifolds. And from this, you see that a prominent role in this theory is played by closed G2 structures. So, G2 structures whose defining three form is closed. And uh, this is one of the motivations to focusing on closed G2 structures and studying them. And we shall see some results about these structures in the second part 
of this uh, of this uh, mini course starting from Thursday. So I think that uh, for today this is enough, and we can stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thanks for the great exposition.